This morning, we continue our examination of the theme over the course of the past weeks. And today, today should be a culmination somewhat of the various areas we have been considering. And the topic for our consideration today is follow me, as you would have heard. And this, of course, is the call of the Lord Jesus, as represented in the passages we just read, where he sought to get the attention of those who followed him, and by extension, for all of us to follow him. Two friends, the story is told, decided that they were going to go fishing, and they had set aside some time, almost an entire week, to go into a certain area and do some fishing. So they invested quite a bit of money. They rented boat, uh, rented a boat, they rented a car, they bought the necessary equipment for fishing, tackle, and you know, all those, some of those items that are sometimes very expensive. In total, they spent about $1,500. So they set out to fish, and the first day they were unsuccessful, not even one. The second day was the same. And for five days, four days in a row, they caught nothing. And on the fifth day, one of the fishermen um, caught a fish, and that was the total catch for the entire fishing trip. On their way back home, as they drove together, one of the fishermen said, do you realize that the one fish that we caught is worth $1,500? The other one said to him, well, it's a good thing we didn't catch more. This is an expensive fish. Brothers and sisters, we are all called to follow the Lord Jesus. And like those he called in the past, including the portions we have read, he's calling us today to go fishing. And we want to remind ourselves that those to whom we are being sent are very expensive to the Lord. Two passages we read speak to the call of the Lord on the lives of those who are named in these passages. But God has always been in the business of calling people and even today, he's still calling and asking us to follow him. And our discussion today is against that background. And I think it's appropriate that we would consider a subject like this as we bring some of these topics to a close, because they all should be pointing to one thing, being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever asked yourself what it is that God wants from me? Maybe what Jesus wants me to do? Do you ask yourselves those questions at times? I certainly do. Maybe you are in a situation where it's a very difficult one. You have been treated unfairly. The unjust treatment is just obvious to everybody. And yet, you are not allowed to react the way you feel. And you wonder in situations like those, if you can't just be normal like everybody else. And you ask the Lord, why has he given you so much to do? I suspect some of you do have these kinds of situations. Maybe not today, but maybe at some point in the past. And certainly if the Lord may not come, you may have that in the future. Maybe you have been a believer for a long time now. And you wonder, what does God want me to do? How can I be a better mom, a better dad, a better brother or sister, a better husband or wife, a better son or daughter? How do I love better? How can I forgive this person, deal with my hurt, share my faith, fix my finances? How do I deal with this sin, this bad habit? This dysfunction, this divorce, loss of hope, depression. I suspect that some of you 
are new to all of this and probably are just exploring with us this morning. Maybe others of you worshiping with us today don't really care at all one way or the other. Let's be honest. I know that sometimes some of the people who worship with us are just trying to keep a happy face and be done with it. I don't know if you know if, if you think I'm right, but I think I am. But what about our church? It's a very interesting time for us as we look for direction. We want answers to the problems we face and the issues that seem to be so divisive at times. For example, we want answers as we think about calling a new pastor and how are we to proceed with this new direction. I'm so very glad that God has a word for us today that can solve every bit of this if we catch what he's teaching and do what he's saying. Actually, not one word, but two words, and they are, follow me. In one of the portions we just had read to us, Luke chapter 5, 27 to 31, we noticed some things about this issue, and I would like to just highlight some of them for your consideration. First of all, I would like you to notice that the call is a very pretty simple one. Follow me. Live, love, leave. <laughs> Following is simple in the wording, but not always simple in the practice. But one thing is very certain, most people understand fully what it means when we are called to follow. Following leads to a reorientation of purpose. For example, with Matthew, he walked away from what defined him. He was known as the tax collector. He was known as the man who handled figures and was very shrewd in his handling of it. He didn't have very many friends, as most people who handle money at the tax department are sometimes described. But what is very important about this that we must bear in mind is that if we are going to follow Jesus, it requires a reorientation of purpose. Things are going to change. Following should also lead to sharing and celebrating. In the account we read in Luke, we noticed that there was a party that was being set up, a party that was going to be a celebratory one for a send-off for somebody who is planning to follow Jesus. We don't see that in our Christian walk, but that's really what it should be like. When we get to the point where we decide that we are going to follow Jesus, there should be a celebration. We don't see that here on earth, but I can guarantee you that happens in heaven when we decide to follow Jesus. Another observation we make is that following will lead to scorn and murmuring if the following is really real. Those of us who choose to follow the Lord diligently, purposefully, and consistently will have people speak about us sometimes in unpleasant ways. We might even overhear some of the things that are said, and they may not be very nice to bear. No wonder there are some Christians who don't make known their Christianity. The fact that they are followers of Jesus, they follow silently, quietly, some kind of private disciple. That is not God's desire, and it should not be ours either. Another observation we have made from this passage is that following means that you are not in charge. The idea of following means that there's somebody else who is leading, and in this case, it's the Lord Jesus. So when I decide to follow, I have to remember that I'm going to have to give up my own sense of direction, my own desires of where I want to go, how fast I want to go, or whether or not I'm going to go at all. Jesus is the one who dictates. Once I make up my mind and I give my commitment that I'm going to follow. Following Jesus means that we are going to be sent out, as in Luke chapter 9 and verse 1. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus called disciples from all lifestyles and occupations, and he gives them only one thing in common. He asked all of us, everyone in the past, 
everyone in the present and those you will call in the future, follow me. Regardless of where you grew up, how you live your life, how much money you have, or what terrible sins you committed, Jesus calls you to become one of his disciples. It doesn't matter if you have slept with hundreds of people, lived a homosexual lifestyle, taken drugs, or even killed someone. Jesus calls you to become one of his disciples. And that is what the church is all about and has been about from the inception. It doesn't matter what your past is like. Jesus calls us to live our old life, live our old life, follow him as our Lord, become transformed to be like him, and go make more disciples. You may be worshiping with us this morning, and you have never said, Lord, I want you to save me. I want to be one of yours. I want to follow you. I want you to know that he's calling you to do so even right now. He wants to make a disciple out of you as he has been making out of many of us. I would like you to know, and I really want you to know clearly some things about following the Lord. I want to say very clearly, because I know there are some groups who teach differently, that following Jesus is not easy. If you decide to seriously follow Jesus, your flesh will rise up at times. There are going to be times when you want to sleep when he says to go. There are going to be times when you don't want to go and he says you must. And flesh will want to fight against the call of the Lord. Following is not easy because your desires will be in conflict at times with the call of God. Sometimes the things you want to do, the things you would prefer to do, are not the things he wants you to do. And there's going to be conflict. I want you to also know that Satan is going to pester you. God will not always allow him every time to do so, but there are times when he will allow in order that you might grow, in order that we might become stronger, in order that we might develop spiritual muscles. I want you to know that following Jesus is not easy because evil thoughts will be constant. We will have to grow with the help of the Holy Spirit, a defensive system that help us to constantly buffet all of the thoughts that come that do not bring God glory. And there are going to be more when you decide that you're going to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is not easy because temptations will be great. The temptations will come from every angle. They will come in all kinds of sizes and forms. And they will come with one intention in mind, to discourage you from following. But you have to know that up front, and we are telling you that up front, so that you are aware that these are things to be expected. Following Jesus is not easy because the circumstances will pull at you. They will challenge you. They will be the kind of situations that will test your faith, so to speak and will attempt to discourage you from following Jesus. But I want to say, despite of all of these things, there is no better way. It is the way to go. It is the way that guarantees success at the end of the day, even though there are going to be rough times as you continue. Because what happens if you don't follow Jesus? If you and I do not follow Jesus, Luke chapter 9, 23 to 27 explains that if we don't follow, our lives will be wasted. Maybe we should just read that portion. I want you to hear it again. I know you know it very well, but I want you to hear it again, the context of our discussion this morning. This is how it reads, Luke 9, 23 to 27. Then he said to them, the Lord Jesus speaking, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, and yet lose or forfeit his very self? 
If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. What a warning. What a challenge. Following Jesus is not easy, but it is the right way. It is the way that will bring a successful end because anything else is misery. If we choose not to follow Jesus, we can expect anger and or resentment to develop. Even to the point where some of us may even want to be angry with God. Why God has allowed this to happen? If we check back, it is not God who is allowing it to happen so much, but because we have chosen not to follow. And the thing about following is that it identifies a clear path. That path will have troubles, but that path leads to success. If we choose not to follow Jesus, we can expect there is sorrow when following him means joy for us. If we don't, it will be sorrow for us. If we don't follow Jesus, we will miss many blessings. Many blessings that God has along the way. Things that you hear us testify of times. Times when things are not going the way we would like them, but because we are obedient, because we are choosing to follow Jesus, he gives us some sweetness along the way. I want to also suggest that if we choose not to follow Jesus, we will lose rewards. You know that God has in store special rewards for those who are faithful followers, those who intend to stick with things as he requires right until the end. Oh yes, there's a long list of rewards that God has in store for those who will remain faithful to the end. And I'm not talking about salvation now. I'm not talking about being saved and going to heaven. I'm talking about tangible rewards that God will give on top of our salvation. So brothers and sisters, I want for it to be very clear because what the elders and other leaders of this church have been saying to us over the past weeks is to understand that there's a, claim, a, a very clear requirement from God a call to follow him. In all of the discussions we have been having about discipleship, in all of the discussions we have been having about what's required, it boils down to just one thing, understanding what it requires to follow the Lord Jesus. No one can follow Jesus without paying a great cost. It is costly, but it cannot be compared with anything that God has in store for those who trust him. Listen to how Paul puts it. I have not seen, neither hear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Matthew left everything. But I tell you, I guarantee you that what he has gotten is far greater. Dietrich Bonifer was a German pastor and theologian, a spy and anti Nazi dissident. He is the founding member of the Confessing Church, one of just a few Christian churches in Germany that openly opposed the Nazi regime in that time. He was imprisoned in 1943 for refusing to join the military and talking against Hitler's persecution of the Jews. Hitler eventually ordered his execution, and Nazis hanged Bonifa in the Flossenburg concentration camp on April 9, 1945, just two weeks before the end of World War II. This great Christian martyr and theologian wrote several books, the most famous, The Cost of Discipleship. In this book, he coined the term cheap grace and called it the mortal enemy of our church. Bonifa, page 43. Cheap grace, he said, is grace without a price. Grace without cost. Preaching forgiveness without repentance 
his cheap grace, he said. That, he said, is grace without discipleship. Page 29 to 30 of his book. Bonifa goes on and contrasts cheap grace with costly grace. Costly grace, he said, is a hidden treasure for which people go and sell all they have to purchase the land where the treasure is hidden. It is the pearl of great price for which the merchant sells all that he has to purchase. The kingdom of God is that great treasure. It is the grace that causes a man to tear out an eye or cut off a hand if it causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ which causes a disciple to leave his nets and follow Jesus. Bonifa, page 30 and 31. No one can serve two masters, the Lord Jesus said. It is either you serve yourself or the devil or Jesus. The question then is, who is in the lead? In our homes, at our jobs, with our kids, in our finances, with our mortality, with our tongues, our thoughts, in all the departments of our lives, who is in the lead? Luke 14, 25 to 33, is not just talking about believing. Lots of people believe and say they love Jesus. You and I know that not everybody who says that means it. Lots of worship even. But all this is internal, even if expressed in a corporate way in a gathering such as ours. Following, however, is external and by its very nature raises the issues of what will it cost us. And this is where we have the greatest challenge because many times we want to follow Jesus, but we don't want to move from where we are. Many times we want to do the things that God wants because we know that that's what he requires. But we like the things we have and where we are too much. We struggle to get away. You know the story, the age-old story of those um, who hunt monkeys and attempt to trap the monkeys by using the coconuts. They cut the coconuts put an orange inside of the coconut, put it back together and leave a hole just big enough for the hand of the monkey to get inside. And when the monkey smells the orange and reaches into the coconut and holds it, the grip now makes the hand much too big to exit the coconut. And in an intention and determination not to let go of the orange, the monkey ends up being caught. Many times, that story is true of those of us who are not following Jesus as we should. We know it's the right thing. We understand what is required, but we don't want to move. But the fact remains, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus calls us to follow him, whether we want to, willing to, or choose not to. The call still remains. He calls you to follow him. He calls me to follow him. But what does that really mean? Here are a few things that it means. It means walking in his footsteps just as he walked. And if we are going to walk in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus as he walked, then we are truly following him. So what if that means you have to love someone you hate? Follow him. What if that means you have to forgive someone who hurt you? Follow him. What if that means you have to submit to leadership who you question? Follow him. What if that means he asks you to do something that makes you uncomfortable? And sometimes the Lord does that. Follow him. What if that means he pushes you further than you really want to go? I say follow him. I want to go on to say further on this point that some people are afraid to go because they fear the Lord may ask them to go further than they are willing to go. What if that means he prompts you to give when you don't have it to give? I know that sounds familiar to some people. I say to you, follow him. Do you see, brothers and sisters, 
The call isn't to preach or teach or marry or stay single or tithe or witness or anything else. It is simply to follow him, to live and love and live just like him. Now, what would we look like if we were really following Jesus? Not just being a Christian, but really followers of the Christ as we understand the scriptures to outlay it for us. What would that look like in our marriages? What would that look like in our children? What would that look like in our schools? What would that look like at the next party? <laughs> what would that look like at our jobs? What would that look like at Bethany if we, all of us, were following Jesus as we should? Brothers and sisters, it excites me to think of the possibilities. If we go back to think of Noah, Noah didn't go to look for advice or blueprints. He just followed what the Lord said. If you think about the early church, the same thing. They didn't go looking for examples to compare with anybody. They just followed what the Lord said. And that is what God is calling us at Bethany and elsewhere to do. So what did these fishermen do? The scripture says Peter and Andrew at once left their nets. It says James and John immediately left the boat and their father. It says Matthew got up and followed him. And at maybe like you, I have always wondered why the wording is so different from Matthew in comparison to the other disciples. I am not sure I do, not, I do know the answer, but I am tempted to suggest that maybe Matthew had a lot more to give up in order to follow Jesus. And it proved very difficult for him as a result. And whether it took him one week, two weeks, one month, I don't know how long it took Matthew. But the good thing about it is that he followed him. Now, what did disciples give up? Simon Peter and his brother Andrew dropped their fishing nets to follow Jesus. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, his brother John, <laughs> left their boat and father to follow Jesus. Bartholomew, likely a farmer, left his family farming business to follow Jesus. Jude and his younger brother James pushed aside their intense and violent nationalist views to follow Jesus. Philip, likely another fisherman, dropped his nets and left his fishing boat to follow Jesus. Simon the Zealot left his zealot views and hatred for everything Roman to follow Jesus. Thomas had to give over his pessimistic views to follow Jesus. We do not know much about Matthias, other than he was already a follower when he was chosen, so had to give up his life to replace Judas and follow Jesus. The most notorious of the apostles, Paul, gave up his life as a Pharisee to follow Jesus. This rag tag group of fishermen, five of them, one farm, one tax collector, two nationalists, one zealot, one pessimist, one latecomer, and one Pharisee made up the group of men Jesus called to be his first disciples. Jesus spent almost four years calling, transforming, and sending them out a discipleship-making process. I want to ask, what will you do today? What will Bethany do today? What will each one of us who have the stamp of the Lord Jesus on our lives call ourselves Christians and call ourselves followers of the Lord do today? I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and just envision for a few moments Jesus calling you. 
Follow me and I will make you fishers of men, he said. Have you answered this call? Have you left your old life to follow him? Are you a true follower or just a fan? Are you allowing him to transform your life into his likeness? Are you telling your story to others? Are you telling others the gospel message? Are you fulfilling his great commission by going and making disciples? If we are not, then we need to realign. We need to follow. Because this is exactly what God wants and nothing less will do. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for the privilege you have given us one more time to pause and examine your words. As the teacher of all teachers, the Holy Spirit makes the things of thine simple to our hearts. We looked at the call again as you extended to your disciples and by extension to all of us. And we have to answer this question. There is no sideways about it. We are called to follow you. There are many hindrances, many difficulties, many challenges. And there's none that has ever answered the call in the past who did not have to leave something behind that they wish not to leave. And it's not different now. And it's not going to be different in the future. The question really is, how much do we really love you? Lord, each one, every single one, will have to answer on our own. We each have to come to that place on our own without looking to the left, right, or anywhere else. Do I love the Lord enough more than these? Enough to follow him more than these? Help us, Lord. Remove the scales from our eyes so we can see that choosing you is the best way to go and we cannot do both. We cannot serve two masters. It has to be one or the other. May we choose you, for we do not want to get it wrong. Help us, precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you.